crimes committed by German forces during the Second World War are a topic which has received a large amount of attention in post-World War II historiography. However, while much has been written, misconceptions still exist, perhaps most notably about which armed forces committed crimes, meaning the Waffen-SS, of course, but often also the Wehrmacht, and when and where. While the largest scale crimes took place in the East from 1941 onward, there were already significant atrocities performed earlier in the war, in 1939 and 1940, not just in Poland but also in France. Today we'll be dealing with the defense of Lyon, while a future video will deal with its bloody aftermath. Since there is a high probability that YouTube will decide to demonetize this video, please consider hitting that like button and leaving a comment so the algorithm doesn't bury us completely. Also, if you're interested in us covering more battles, do consider donating any small amount via Patreon, PayPal, or even YouTube Super Thanks. We are a small non-profit with little income, so every little bit helps in acquiring sources and paying people for the services. After the outbreak of the Second World War, the war escalated further when, beginning on May 10th, 1940, German forces advanced through northeastern France and the previously neutral Netherlands and Belgium. The exact details of the early campaign, how German troops were able to encircle the British BEF, Belgian and Dutch armies and much of the French army, particularly the French cavalry divisions and much of the best equipped infantry ones, are very well known. However, after the pocket containing these units was closed at Dunkirk, the campaign did not immediately end. While the Allies had suffered a major loss that almost certainly doomed France's ability to hold its mainland, there were efforts made from mid-May onward to re-establish a defensive line, mostly along the Somme. On June 5, 1940, after the Dunkirk pocket had been taken, German forces began Operation Case Yellow, meant to pierce through the remaining French defensive line and occupy the rest of France. The earliest phases caused heavy losses to German troops, which have often been forgotten in modern historiography. However, significantly outnumbered by German troops and having lost much of their best equipment at the Dunkirk pocket, French troops soon started to be overrun and encircled, as a lightning-fast German advance through France began. German troops spread to the southeast from the Somme area, to the rear of the now useless Maginot Line. At the forefront of German advance south were the Gross Deutschland Infantry Regiment, the 10th Panzer Division and the 3rd SS Panzer Division Totenkopf. At a glance it seemed that within a couple of days German forces could hope to reach Lyon unopposed. Lyon was, and still is, near the position of second largest French agglomeration, having historically competed with the Mediterranean city of Marseille for this position. The city, and particularly its agglomeration, counted a large amount of industrial, but also academic and cultural facilities. On June 10, 1940, Italy declared war on France and Great Britain, evidently due to the imminent collapse of France, and began an offensive attempt on the French border. However, unlike in the northeast, French troops held Italian troops at bay, due to a combination of easily defensible terrain, significant defensive works already present, and good training of French Alpine troops. However, the quick advance of German troops in eastern France, evident notably with the fall of Dijon, threatened to smash through the back lines and logistics that enabled the Army of the Alps resistance against the Italians. It is largely for this reason that the French High Command decided to attempt to organize a defensive line on the River Rhone, with reconnaissance of potentially defensible areas beginning around June 15th. To defend this front line, the French had a meager force under their orders, the Lyon subdivision, as well as troops from a variety of units retreating before the German tide. These were composed of a number of old retreating soldiers from northern France, 
conscripts from Lyon and other close cities, some undertrained foreign legionnaires, and logistics and artillery troops from the Lyon area, all disorganized without a clear unit structure. Troops from one particular logistical depot, which were called into the defensive forces, the men of Depot 131, were reported to be armed with Model 1916 rifles, old machine guns, but quite shockingly did not have any protective helmets. An officer of Depot 132, also called into the defensive line, described the state of his men as having very little armament, equipment almost non-existent, apparel lacking. Artillery equipment included 10 anti-aircraft 75mm pieces which had been taken out of their defensive mounts in Lyon and placed on improvised wooden carriages, and which had to be moved by hand without motorized tractors or seemingly even horses. The exact 75mm gun model is unclear. These could have been modern pieces such as the Schneider model 1930, 1932, 33 or 36, but they could also and perhaps more likely have been older pieces, such as the model 1915, directly based on the 75mm model 1897 field gun. More positively, eight modern 47mm SA-37 anti-tank guns were present, recently delivered to the Lyon train station. These were very potent pieces, though also very few when it came to defending a 32 km long front against multiple armored units. They were delivered without any training, meaning the crews would have to familiarize themselves with the guns as they first used them. Beyond these disorganized forces, two better organized ones were present. Elements of the 405th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Regiment and, likely the centerpiece of the French defense, the 25th Senegalese Tirailleur Regiment. The commander described this regiment as a good colonial regiment, intact, fresh, and well armed. The unit had been formed in mid April 1940 near Bordeaux, with battalions that had been shipped to France in late 1939. The regiment was about 3,000 strong, divided between 71% indigenous or black troops with the rest being European men in various positions of command, logistics, and organization. The unit was organized with three fighting battalions, each comprising three companies of riflemen and a support company including a machine gun section, a mortar section outfitted with two 81mm mortars, and an anti-tank section outfitted with two 25mm SA-34 pieces. In total, and including some additional regimental assets, the regiment's noteworthy equipment included 48 heavy machine guns, 113 automatic rifles and light machine guns, 9 60mm mortars, 8 81mm mortars, 12 25mm anti-tank guns, 147 rifles equipped with rifle grenades, and 6 Renault UV logistical tankettes. It is worth noting here that the name of Senegalese Tirailleurs may be slightly misleading. While many of the men were indeed from Senegal, where French colonial authorities were most thoroughly implanted, recruitment was not limited to this specific subdivision. It extended to all of French Occidental Africa, meaning modern-day Benin, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Senegal, Mali, Mauritania, and Niger. In total, by April 1940, about 180,000 Senegalese tirailleurs were reported to be serving, which would likely have been far too much for Senegal alone to support. The 25th had been moved to the reserves of the Army of the Alps during spring 1940. On June 14th, the 3rd Battalion of the regiment was separated to be given other orders, with the core of the unit given the order to move towards Lyon to take part in its defense, reaching there on June 16th and taking defensive positions from June 17th to 19th. The unit commander was a 50-year-old World War I veteran. The establishment of the defensive line to the north of Lyon took place in particular circumstances, even by the standards of a France in nationwide collapse facing Case Yellow. The 25th had not yet reached its defensive position, 
as French Council President Paul Renault resigned and was replaced by World War I figure Philippe Pétain. The next day on June 17th, Pétain transmitted to German authorities that he was seeking an agreement to cease fire and pronounced a speech heard on French radios nationwide in which he called for an armistice with words that would remain famous. It is with the heart clenched that I tell you today that we must stop fighting. Pétain's speech hastened an already ongoing process of French troops mass surrendering or ceasing to fight, with the numbers of prisoners taken by German troops increasing dramatically from June 17th onward. In the case of the 25th Regiment, this nationwide context of abandonment of fighting was supplemented by local efforts by the municipality of Lyon. On June 18th, Pétain approved a request from the mayor to declare Lyon an open city in a move similar to Paris, in order to avoid fighting and destruction within the agglomeration. General Vegan, current commander of the French forces, gave the order not to destroy bridges on the two rivers which met at Lyon. In practice, the troops preparing the defense of the line to the northwest of Lyon saw the city they were supposed to defend give up on its defense just behind them. There were also efforts by the mayors or officials of some of the smaller localities French troops were preparing to defend north of Lyon to convince commanding French officers to surrender. Despite Pétain's speech and Lyon being declared an open city on June 18th, defensive preparations did not cease. It had become evident that the meager forces available, essentially two-thirds of a colonial regiment supplemented by a number of disparate soldiers from various sources, could never hope to defend the entire stretch of the 32-kilometer long front line. It was instead decided to organize a limited number of defensive positions, reinforced as much as possible within the short time frame the defenders had to prepare, concentrated on the two national roads that linked Lyon to the north and west. Straight to the north, the 1st Battalion of the 25th was to hold positions near National Road 6, coming from the Dijon direction. The 2nd Battalion was to hold positions along National Road 7, coming from Orléans. Crossroads were blocked and fortified, individual foxholes were dug, and a few select bridges were mined. Information began to spread on the morning of June 19th that the arrival of German troops was imminent. With defensive positions located on the National Roads, a constant stream of refugees and soldiers who had lost their units passed through them. The first fighting happened on positions on the National 6 at around 8 a.m. on June 19th. At that moment, a German column of the Gross Deutschland entered a locality just slightly beyond the French defensive line. A French motorcyclist arrived at the forefront of the French defensive line at 9.15 a.m., warning of the impending arrival of German forces. Minutes later, the first German reconnaissance troops arrived. At first, a small number of soldiers progressed with a white flag and tried to convince the French that an armistice had been signed and that the fighting was over. French troops followed their orders and began firing on the German scouts. A French adjutant reported the German troops that had reached the barrage immediately retaliated with submachine guns. The leading German car had been followed by armored cars and trucks loaded with infantry. These were first fired upon by the French and quickly fired back. This specific location, mont and its convent, included two of the 405th anti-aircraft 75mm pieces placed in the convent courtyard. French reports state that their fire was very effective, though a piece was swiftly destroyed by opposing fire. Telephone communications with defensive positions on the National 6 were reported as ruptured at around 1 p.m. German progression continued with increased infantry presence in the afternoon. French troops claimed to have destroyed several German armored vehicles. In the early afternoon, French troops were forced out of external positions and into the convent itself. At some locations, bayonet fighting was also reported. The Mont-Luzon convent was overrun around 4 p.m., 
the vast majority of its defenders having been wounded during the fighting. After the position was overran and French troops surrendered, Senegalese wounded were finished off by German troops, the first of many executions on the National Sixth Front. Casualties on the French side are reported to have been of 50 military and one civilian killed for the French, who claim to have caused around 40 German casualties. As the Montlezan convent offered significant resistance, German troops had attempted to circumvent it through the locality of Lisieux, on the other side of the National Six, only to meet another French point of resistance in the small village and on neighboring Hill 272. This defending location also sported two 75mm guns. Fighting took place until the late afternoon of June 19th, when German troops overran French defensive positions around 5 p.m. after having destroyed the two 75mm guns. Execution of Senegalese prisoners were also reported there. On another crossroad slightly further, German troops were again stopped, this time by the 47mm anti-tank guns, though these were destroyed after some resistance. However, while progression around the National Six was slow, German troops managed to circumvent the French defences by going eastward, where they were able to break through in locations which were defended by disparate, poorly trained and equipped foreign legion elements. By mid-afternoon, German scouting elements were entering Lyon from the east, unopposed, and by 4pm they seized the Lyon prefecture in the city centre. No resistance was met within the city of Lyon itself. However, somewhat paradoxically, while Lyon had fallen, the National Sixth segment in front of it was still partially held by troops of the 25th RTS. Some positions encountered German troops but held. Crucially, a single fortified point, Chasselet, was not reached by German troops. Fighting on the National Seven to the west of National Six also began on June 19th, but later during the day. In this area, the leading German formation was the 3rd SS Panzer Division Totenkopf, which had been following the National 7 Road. The leading elements of Totenkopf reached the western edge of the northern Lyon defensive perimeter in the mid-afternoon. The French positions were held by remnants of the 131st Infantry Regiment. Resistance there was unexpected and the SS troops took some losses, but were able to rapidly reorganize and use support from light armored vehicles and artillery to overrun the 131st positions. Tottenkopf troops then reached the next major point of resistance. This position was held by the 2nd Battalion of the 25th Regiment. The Tirailleurs did not occupy the town due to fears of causing civilian casualties, perhaps due to pressure from municipal authorities, but instead took position at a major crossroad located near the town. At around 6pm on June 19th, Tottenkopf troops entered the town and found it empty, before coming under fire from French positions at the eastern exit of the town. Intense combat took place on the evening of June 19th and continued at lower intensity, but never completely stopped during the night seeing German troops stuck against the French position at the neighboring crossroad. French positions were subject to significant artillery fire, which also spread into the town. Orders to retreat were given to the entire 25th RTS from 4.32pm onward, with more following during the evening and night from June 19th to June 20th. However, with the unit already engaged, a complete retreat was found to be barely possible and at best, the troops retreated to the next position still held within the defensive line. Fighting resumed at high intensity on the morning of June 20th, with SS troops having to finish taking the French positions at the crossroad, then on to the directly neighboring villages, which had a commandeering position on the south of the National 7 Road. In the late morning, German troops faced the final resistance of two companies of the 2nd Battalion of the 25th on a plateau to the west of Lyon. Anecdotally, a French commander wrote that German troops assaulted the French marching and chanting, seemingly not expecting intense fighting this late in the campaign and perhaps having been informed of the fall of Lyon, and that losses were heavy for both sides. The last French troops were overrun around 2pm. The prisoners taken were grouped into three categories and treated accordingly. 
European officers were taking aboard trucks to be taken into custody. European men of the rank and NCOs were taken on foot. Lastly, the African prisoners, numbering 28, were immediately shot. Back to the National 6 front, to the east of National 7 and more directly north of Lyon, during the late afternoon and evening of June 19th, remaining elements of the 1st Battalion were regrouped under Captain Guzzi. Having taken very high losses during the day, with several defensive points overrun outright, Guzzi decided to regroup his troops within one last defensive point, rather than several dispersed ones, in order to resist for as long as possible. While the defensive line always had a more of a delaying than a stopping role, with the fall of Lyon behind the defending troops, it was evident that the best they could do now was hold German units attacking them in place for as long as possible. And evidently, this would be best done with a single as strong as possible position rather than a number of dispersed ones that would be too on demand to hold for long. French troops gathered in Chasselet. More precisely, they did not occupy the town of Chasselet, but rather the small castle of Planton. The castle was hastily fortified as best as could be done by the remaining troops during the night. Fighting resumed in the mid-morning of June 20th as a German reconnaissance patrol was spotted and fired upon by the tirailleurs. It appears German troops were once again not expecting resistance this late into the campaign, and with Lyon having fallen behind the French defensive line. The main German assault on the castle began around 1.30pm. German troops meticulously searched the town, unoccupied by French troops, before launching an infantry assault supported by armor on the castle around 3 p.m. The small position held for an hour. Around 4 p.m., with most men out of ammunition, Captain Guzzi ordered his last defenders to surrender. German troops entered the castle and captured a total of three officers, two European NCOs, three European men at the rank, and 51 African tirailleurs. A few remaining elements of the 25th RTS were able to escape the battles around the northern Lyon defensive line, and were located far to the south when the armistice entered into force on June 25th. This concludes our look at the desperate but futile defense of Lyon. In a future video, we'll be looking at the actions taken by the victorious Germans after their success and the shameful mark they leave on European history to this day. Until next time, keep us in your sights.